Hi, my name is Dan and I'm part of the team here at HTBB and I'm excited to be kicking off the next few weeks teaching where we're going to be looking at building. Building God's church, rebuilding our lives and today building your inner life. Humans love transformation stories. It's why one of the most popular types of TV shows are makeover shows, from transforming your look, to transforming your team, to transforming your house, to transforming your car, to transforming your dog. And I think that part of the reason these kind of shows are so popular is that the original call on humanity was to transform, to extend the boundaries of Eden and transform the wilderness into a garden, to work is to transform, to join in with God's spirit, bringing order out of chaos. And transformation therefore resonates with our purpose in life. But also we're told that this is what God longs for each and every one of us, that we would be transformed into what he created us to be. The technical word for this transformation is sanctification. And the most helpful description I've heard of what this means is to be reparented into the family of God. God has welcomed us into his home, but now he's teaching us how to enjoy being part of his family so that we become people who live in a way that Jesus would have lived if he was in our place. In the chapter we're going to look at today in the book of Romans, Paul gives us a description of what a Jesus transformed, Jesus shaped life looks like. And here is some of how he describes it. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow. What a vision for life. What a vision for the way we could be. I would love to be like that. But in my own strength, Paul might as well have asked me to run through this wall. But the wonderful news is that this isn't the starting place. This list is in chapter 12 of the book of Romans with the first 11 chapters talking about what Jesus has done for you. This is therefore what is now available to you in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And just before this description, he starts by explaining how it is that we become a people like this. And this is what we're going to focus on today. And as I read this now, know that this is what your Father in heaven longs for you today. So this is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and two. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Amen. Amen. What Paul is describing here is the process by which we're transformed into the likeness of Jesus. In other words, how we change. Now, anyone who's ever tried to change themselves or manage change in an organisation knows that change is hard. The, the absolute best evidence for this is the existence of a product called Clocky. Clocky is an alarm clock, but no ordinary alarm clock. It has wheels. You set it at night and in the morning when the alarm goes off, it rolls off your bedside table, probably knocking your drinking water over, and scurries off, forcing you to run around your bedroom in your pajamas to chase it down. And this product has sold in its millions. Now, let's be blunt. Clocky is not a product for a sane species. Like if Dr. Spock from Star Trek wants to get up at 5.45 a.m., he just gets up, no drama required. But humans are not of one mind. And so change is hard. There is part of us that wants to get up early and make the most of the day, and another part that loves to lie in and snooze. 
many models of how our brains work describe it as having an emotional side and a rational side, and they don't always agree. And in popular culture, one side is often prized over the other, but actually both parts are a gift. And in this reading, Paul speaks to every part of us. Now, an image that I find helpful when it comes to thinking about change is from the writer Jonathan Haidt, who says to picture an elephant with a little rider traveling down a path. The elephant is your emotions, the rider is your reason, and the path is your environment. And to see change happen, you need to motivate that elephant, you have to direct the rider, and you have to shape the path. And what I want to suggest is that you can think about this verse through that lens. Motivate the elephant in view of God's mercy. Direct the rider. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice and shape the path. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And the resulting change is that then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. So let's explore what these amazing words mean for us. First of all, God motivates our elephant. And this is important because the elephant can either provide the energy needed for change or the power to bring the whole thing to a grinding halt. Paul writes, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. This is our motivation for change. But what does it mean? One of the ways to understand what a Bible verse means, especially when it's a more technical verse like this, is to ask, what would the opposite be? So for this one, one way to get the verse wrong would be, I command you, my students, in view of God's anger, to dutifully repay him with your best, which may be good enough for him, but let's be honest, probably not. This is not the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the reason I find this helpful is that I often discover that functionally the wrong version better describes what I believe than what God has actually said to us. For example, in view of God's anger instead of his mercy, how many times have I beat myself up or beat up on others, forgetting that, as James says, human anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. Actually, the thing that Jesus says will bring about the change we want to see is not his anger at our sin, but an understanding of his mercy towards us despite our sin. Breaking down that verse, he starts by saying, therefore. In other words, in light of the 11 chapters that have gone before us, where he lays out the problem of our sin, our helplessness to make it right, that he sent his own son to die in our place, that we receive this work by faith, that he gives us his Holy Spirit, that he makes us part of his family, in, in summary, in view of God's mercy. That's how you could sum up the entire Old Testament, in view of God's mercy. How you could sum up all of church history, in view of of God's mercy, how you could sum up each and every one of our own stories in view of God's mercy, in view of all that he has done for us. That is what motivates us to change. Now, it's not to say that there aren't other ways to try and fuel the change. In the same way that there are different fuels for different cars, some cars take diesel, some take unleaded, though I've never quite worked out what the difference is between the different types of unleaded, like RON95 and RON97. I presume RON97 is better, but what happened to RON96? Anyway, uh, and we're obviously all being urged to move towards renewable fuels, which isn't because fossil fuels don't work, but because they burn dirty. You can think of that with your motive for becoming like Jesus. See, there are other fuels Paul could have used to motivate us. He could have said, in view of your potential, or in view of all your achievements, or in view of others' expectations, or in view of God's expectations. As motives for change, all of those bring about a short-term burst of energy, but ultimately they run out of power and produce all kind of striving which is not the life Jesus has for us. Instead, it's in view of God's mercy, which is a brilliant motivator because it's not dependent on how I'm doing. 
nor is it dependent on if anyone else is watching. And it is not earned, but flows out of a joy within us as we focus on how much we are forgiven. Now, one question I had that struck me as being a little bit strange was, why not in view of God's love or in view of God's grace, but in view of his mercy? And I think it's because we will all struggle to accept this. Like, you could, you could think of it a bit like an experiment. In an experiment, you have the constant that you keep the same, and then you have the variable you fiddle with, and then you measure what happens and the outcome. And the way to get this wrong is to think that the constant is me trying really hard, and the variable is how much God loves me. But he makes it clear that the constant is his mercy. He doesn't love us because we are lovely, but he loves us because he is merciful. His mercy is constant. The variable is how much we are willing to offer and present ourselves as living sacrifices. And the less you offer, the less you will fully understand what his will is for your life, but it will not change how much he loves you. To land this like really practically, like Paul doesn't say, uh, I command you to sort yourselves out and then offer your best. He says, I urge you, i.e. today, now, now is the moment. Don't wait until you've sorted yourself out. Today is the day to come to him. And you come to him with your body, i.e. not your best life or your best intentions. He wants you. There are, there are no qualifiers. It's not offer your beach ready body. It's simply your body, who you are today, offer that. He doesn't want the perfect you. He wants the you you. He doesn't love the future you. He loves the now you. That is the mercy of our God. To really try and land this home, and I know I'm laboring this point, but this is what, hey, Paul says to urge, urges us to focus on, right, is that the word Paul uses here for mercy is tied with the Hebrew word for compassion, which comes from the word womb. This is the kind of compassion with suffering that he's wanting us to imagine, the mercy that a mother has towards her own child. What wouldn't a mother do for her child? This is not just the one-off mercy. This is the again and again and again and again mercies of God that took Jesus to the cross for you and for me to die in our place. And you can immediately see how this starts to change us because Paul, Paul demonstrates it for us here. See, the way you think God speaks to you will be the way you speak to others. The way you are led is the way you will lead. Paul, as we said before, could have said, I command you, my students. He is, after all, very learned. He's a teacher. He's an apostle picked by Jesus. But because he's received mercy, he is merciful. And instead he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters. The word urge is parakello, which means to be beside, to call alongside. And it's the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit. Paul is leading others as he himself has been led. God does not stand on high issuing commands, but he gets right up close to us by his Holy Spirit and urges us on. Nor does Paul call them his students, but my brothers and sisters. The tone is not of a boss issuing commands, but of the leader who is in the trenches with his team. As you are led, you will lead. And Jesus leads us with his mercy. So never be stingy with mercy. There is no better motivator than God's mercy. But having the motivation, we then need to know what it is we're being motivated towards. To see transformation, we motivate the elephant, but then you also need to direct the rider. You direct the rider so that they can guide the power of our emotions, like a little rider, on a massive elephant. And to direct the rider, Paul does something really helpful for us here. He shrinks the change. That list we looked at earlier is quite a long list of what a Jesus-shaped life looks like. But even then, that's not comprehensive. And if you tried to recall that list every time you had to make a decision, well, you'd be overwhelmed. Instead, Paul shrinks all of it down into one clear physical action. He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
The image he's drawing from here is temple worship, where sacrifices were offered, and in particular, a thanksgiving offering. In the Jewish temple worship, this was done by a burnt offering. You would bring your best animal without blemish, and you would burn all of it on the altar as a symbol saying, God, in light of all you have given me, all I have is yours. This is how we are to now offer our lives. And the list of all those things are just what a living sacrifice looks like in ordinary, everyday situations. For example, if someone persecutes you, bless them. If someone's rude to you at work, compliment them behind their back. Like, die to your right to revenge. If you're in a hurry but somebody asks you for help, you die to your putting yourself first to your agenda. The image is, I carry my life up to the altar and I leave it there, and then I take my hands off my life. I give it to you, Jesus. But why would we do this? Well, this is the reason Paul gives. He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And there are three reasons, past, present and future, of why you should take your hands off of your life. The past, look at what he's done. In a Thanksgiving offering, you gave your best, spotless animal, the one without blemish, the best you have to offer. In this image, what is that? It's you. Because of what Jesus has done, you are now spotless and without blemish. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He is pleased with you in Jesus. Jesus has demonstrated that he has done what we are, we're all striving to do, which is to make ourselves good, presentable, and pleasing. Now in Jesus, you can just be you. No visco filter required. Then look at what he's doing in the now. Paul says, this is your true and proper worship, i.e the right way to worship, the right way to live your life. See, transformation isn't just about the goal, it's about the way to the goal. This is what Jesus meant when he said he is the way, the truth and the life. To become like Jesus is to live like Jesus. How would you best describe Jesus' life? A living sacrifice, to die to ourselves. That is the shape of the Christian life. And, and not because death in of itself is a good thing, but because of what comes next, the third reason. Look at what he's promised to do. In the original language, it's really stark. He literally says to offer your life as a living killing. This is the seeming paradox of the heart of our faith, that as you die to yourself, you will live. This is what he describes as true worship, because there are other ways, false ways to worship. The choice isn't between will you offer your life or will you not offer your life as a sacrifice, but to who or to what will you offer your life as a living sacrifice? It could be your career or your worries or the approval of other or, or your own independence. And what you worship, you will sacrifice for. But none of those things will ever give you your life back. Every one of those things will let you down in the end. Jesus is the only altar that makes you alive, the only master who sets you free. When you worship Jesus, when you give him your life as a living, killing, dying to your will and living for his, the Holy Spirit makes you alive. Here's that as a promise earlier on in the letter in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This means that when Jesus is present, whenever there is a death, there is always a resurrection. We are all sacrificing to something, sacrifice to the one who will make you alive. And this is the reward for our obedience, that you will know what his will for your life is. And not only know it, but you'll delight in it. And his will will be so delightful to you, to you that you'll be able to obey his will with joy.
This is what he says the result is. Then you'll be able to test and approve of what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The reward of obedience is understanding. Put as a rhyme, to understand why, submit and apply. To understand why, submit and apply. See, if you say the opposite, God, I'll obey if X, Y, Z, if I understand first, or if you give me a spouse, or if you take away this pain, whatever is on the other side of that if is the true God that you are actually sacrificing for. But he has proved, come on, he's proved that he's wiser than you. He's proved that he loves you more than you love you. He's proved uh, himself more infinitely qualified to run my life than I am. He is the only one who can make a sacrifice alive. He wants more than just the fat around the edges. He wants all of us. And he's shown on the cross that he will make more of our lives than we would on our own. We motivate the elephant. We direct the rider finally to bring about the change we want to see. We have to shape the path. Now, we encounter this kind of action, shaping the path every day, but probably without being aware of it. The canned laughter on a TV show. Uh, the door lock on a plain toilet. There's also the light switch, so you can't use the toilet without locking the door, very clever. And the markings on a road keeping us in our lane. Though in my experience, this is less effective on taxi drivers. All of these shape the path and have a massive impact on how we behave and whether or not change will be successful. Paul puts it like this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Humans are massively social creatures. We, we look to others to know how to behave. Now, the danger is that we'll naturally go with the flow, unless we are proactive. We like to think of ourselves as free agents, but we really aren't. Like, recent example, in the first month, after the most recent series of Love Island streamed on Netflix, lip filler appointments increased 32%. 32%! I've had to wait weeks to be seen. The story we live in is the story we live out. So there is a danger, but there is also an opportunity. It means that you can, in, if you intentionally shape the culture around you, it will help you live the way that you want to. The process of this shaping is often called a rule of life, or spiritual disciplines, or holy habits, or sanctification sit-ups. Actually, I just made that one up. But uh, the aim of these spiritual disciplines is to turn up the volume of God's story over and against the volume of the story the culture around you is telling you about you. Or in Paul's words, it's a way of keeping God's mercy in view. Not in the periphery, not in a blind spot, but his mercy, front and center, both eyes on the cross. And to help you in this endeavor, this week in the lead up to Vision Sunday, we're releasing five videos, each looking at a different aspect of building your inner life so that you can work on keeping his mercy front and center. And this is the promise. We're told that a result of this is we will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So a question to take with you into the week is this. What thoughts do you need transformed? What thoughts do you need transformed? And the great news is that even before we begin to feel that transformation, we can say, praise God that I won't always think this way. Praise God that you have promised to move. You are bringing dead things back to life. And we can be confident that the Holy Spirit is powerful enough uh, to bring this change because we've seen it before. You can see it in Paul's words here. Paul was this self-righteous, religious, authoritarian guy whose pride led him to take the lives of other people that he disagreed with. People who he is now humble enough to call brother and sister. But what's even more remarkable is who those people are. See, at the end of this letter, he signs off and he sends his regards to everyone. And so does everyone that's with him. They all send their greetings. And there's this amazing line in chapter 16. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. 
Erastus, who's basically the CFO of an entire city, and Quartus, a man whose name is just a number. He's a, he's a former slave. They are brothers together in Christ. This isn't just internal, but this is external, radical, societal change. This is reconciliation and transformation of all things that God longs to see and longs for his church to be part of. And he starts with us. Amen. Why don't we, we stand wherever we are? We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and renew us, to bring life uh, to every part of our being. So let's pray. You might find it helpful to put your hands out in front of you as we do this as a sign to say, Jesus, I, I offer you my life. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need to hear you urging us on. We can't do this without you. And so we ask that you would come and fill every person watching this now, that you would fill every home wherever we are. Holy Spirit, we wait on you.